Thank you very much. It's nice to be back with you all. And if anyone has joined us for the first time, uh, welcome. <clears throat> what we have tonight is a message from the Bible uh, directly relevant to you. And so we're going to read from the Bible in the Gospel of Luke and chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, and we will read at verse 1. Luke 13 and 1 says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We've read some very uh, solemn verses tonight from the Gospel of Luke. Um, I've been drawn to these verses for a specific reason. I'll, I'll try to explain that to you in just a minute. But what I want to leave with you are these three words that I would just like to just like you to think about and like you to be impressed with uh, today and, and throughout the week, even if the Lord gives that to you, except you repent. Three words directly from the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus as a gospel preacher was the best that has ever existed. Of course, no one ever spoke like Christ. Even his enemies said, never a man spake like this man. They marveled at the gracious words that proceeded from his mouth. And I have been drawn to this passage, and I'm just going to tell you why just now. You know, in our world today, one of the conversations that we are having uh, constantly with people, whether it's at a coffee shop or your neighbors, friends, coworkers, is about current events. And unfortunately, the, the current events that are being discussed today um, they're not the most pleasant things. Nobody's talking about uh, great successful things that are happening or things that give you a lot of joy or things that give you a lot of happiness. Actually, the current events that are being talked about are very sad things. Um, things like violence and killings and the uncertainty politically and who's the best candidate for the office and uh, terrible natural disasters that are going on. Some that have swept through the lower part of the United States recently, the fires that are raging over in California just now. I mean, just awful things that are going on in our world. And never mind, hello, COVID-19. COVID never mind uh, the big one that's spreading throughout the entire world. Great disasters. And I've just been at a loss in some of these conversations with people I've talked to just in the last week and in the weeks uh, in the past as to what to say. How do you respond? Some of the issues are so nuanced. They're so difficult. How do you respond? And I've just been drawn to this question. How would Christ respond? How would the Lord Jesus Christ respond? If today, instead of coming like he did uh, those thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago to Judea and that region, if instead he came to the United States, and if instead he came in 2020 to our region, and he lived in our, in our, in our country, and, and, and he was presented with the situations that are going on today, and cases of, of violence, and social justice issues, and civil unrest, and uh, political issues, and this disease and natural disasters, how would he respond? And I've been drawn to this passage because actually, this is very similar to our day. What happened in this story, what happened when the Lord Jesus was here preaching and speaking in this region, as people approached him about current events, and they asked him this, they gave him an issue where the government was responsible for the death of a specific group of people. It says it was the Galileans, right? It was the government, Pilate, he was the governor, targeting, killing a specific group of people rather unjustly. It says it was while they were sacrificing. 
while they were worshiping and sacrificing, the governor had killed these people. And these pe and the crowds brought this situation to Jesus. And they told him about this, this that happened. And they wanted to know now, here is a government responsible killing. Here's a killing of somebody in authority. What do you think about it, Lord? What do you think about it, Christ? And here's the one who had the most compassion for human life. He created human life. Here's the one who had the greatest care. Here's the one who gives the standard for why all men are equal, regardless of culture. It's found in Christ and in his creation. And yet he presses on the crowd that day these three words. Except you repent. You also will perish. He wasn't dodging the question. And the Bible in the New Testament has a lot to say about some of those issues. But he was pressing on them the more important question. And he was pressing on them the more important need, the more urgent thing. And he, he himself gives another situation. Not the government targeting some people and, and they're killed and the, all the discussion about that. But he talks about just a natural disaster that happened. So there was a tower in Siloam. It just collapsed. 18 people died. And he says, but it's not that those people died because they were in the sight of God more sinful than any of you standing here. No, no, he says the reason that it's not even about the fact that they died in these natural disasters that can cause distractions among us. He says, no, but except you repent. You will also perish. You see these words, except you repent. And so Jesus, when faced, right, like, like if you want to know, how would he respond? How would Christ respond if you asked him about, you know, a shooting? Or if you asked him about some of the social justice, what would he say if he was here today? You know what he would say? He would turn to the crowds just like he did then. He said, except you repent. Unless you repent, you will also perish. You see, Christ, though he loved and got involved and cared for people, he sat with publicans and sinners. He journeyed to Samaria to heal and, and, and save a woman who was so, so confused and so abused. And yet his one mission was to press upon people the most important issue. You see, someone has once said that the most important thing is that the most important thing always remains the most important thing. The most important issue, the most important danger that is in the, in, in the face of people, people like who are listening here tonight, is not a killing by the hand of some government official. It's not even whether that's just or unjust. It's not a natural disaster that could happen. That's not even the threat of COVID-19. The most dangerous issue is what Jesus says here, perishing. And he says, listen, all these issues that are distracting you around you, these current events, and you're wondering, and you're getting caught up in the different debates politically, and you're just assuming that you'll be sitting there in your seat that you're sitting in now, or you'll be standing there come November, and you'll be there to see who's elected into office. No, my friend, none of that is guaranteed to any one of us. None of us. There's one more important and dangerous issue, and it's the issue of perishing. And Jesus says that what needs to happen is that you must repent. Well, maybe you say, I don't know what that means. What does that mean to repent? Well, I'm going to explain it to you, and I hope so to do it simply. What does it mean to repent? But I want you to first of all notice what he says. He says that that's what needs to happen. You must repent to avoid perishing. Perishing in the Bible just means to be to go to hell. To endure the judgment of God for your own sins. To end up in hell and eventually the lake of fire for eternity. This is what it is to perish. And the Lord Jesus says that there's one thing required that you must repent. Now notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say you have to join a church and then you won't perish. He doesn't say you have to pray, except you pray that you won't. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say you have to memorize the Bible. He doesn't say you have to give a lot of money. He says, except you repent, you will perish. I want to ask you, everyone here on this call tonight, have you repented? Have you turned. You see, sometimes in the gospel, I know I do this so often, and maybe some who have preached the gospel here through this medium have done it as well. The kind of format that people start out with is, 
okay, there's a problem. There's a problem. They emphasize that problem to people. And then they say, but there's a great answer. And then the next part of their message, they're emphasizing that answer. Great thing to do. And then at the last little bit, maybe two minutes left, they emphasize that. Now, there's something, a responsibility you have. You need to believe. You need to receive. You need to accept. You need to trust. You need to come. You need to rest. Whatever words people use. And that's kind of their format. You know, the problem, the answer. And now this is what you need to do. You know what's so interesting about the Lord Jesus, the way he preached many times? He started with what you need to do. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He started with what they needed to do. Come. And when it comes to this subject, he started first with the responsibility that people have before them. Repent. Accept you. Repent. This is something you need to do. You see, we emphasize in the gospel. Somebody has just talked to me about this recently. Someone who's not saved. And they said something like this. You know, I know what people are saying there about God's salvation. And salvation is of the Lord, they say. And so I understand what you men are preaching, that God has to save me. And it's up to God. And I'll just leave it in his court. And, you know, I'm going to watch the football game tonight. Hope my team does well. And I'm going to have a good time this Sunday night and through this week. And when God's good and ready to save me, well, he'll just come down and save me. But until then, I'm happy to live my own life. No, my friend. No, that's a total misunderstanding of what the message of the Bible is. The message of the Bible is that there is something that you must do. You must do it. Now, doing this is not any way going to earn God's favor or salvation or anything like that. But you must do this. You must repent. Accept. These are the words of Christ now. Not my words. Accept. You repent. You shall also perish. So what does it mean to repent? I could tell you many things that it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean to reform your life and try to become the best version of yourself. It doesn't mean to get on your knees and try to confess every possible sin that you can remember. It doesn't mean to shed millions of tears and such great sorrow. It doesn't mean to go through a long journey where you beat yourself up. None of that is what it means to repent. Do you know what repentance means? It's very simple. Repentance, the word means to change your mind. It's a change of mind. And I want to explain that and just use that tonight in the gospel. And I want you not to hear it from me. You know, I'm just an unknown, random person. I want you to hear it from Christ. This is what Christ, I believe, would say to you if you asked him today, Lord, what do you think about what happened in the, in the uh, police killing of that man? What do you think about what happened with the natural disaster that's going through California? He would tell you, except you repent. You also will perish. So what does it mean to repent? To change your mind. This is not a change of mind like I want uh, chicken for supper tonight. Oh, I changed my mind. I'd rather have beef. You know, we do that all the time. It's not talking about a change of mind that's so shallow like that. No, it's a deep change of mind. It's a change of mind where a person is going one direction and they turn around 180 degrees and go the other direction. It's the change of mind that the law and uh, standards in society expect of you when they put up those signs on the road, when you take the exit and it says wrong way. And if you're on that road and you see wrong way, you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to change your direction. Maybe this will help you when God is speaking of a change of mind. When he speaks to you that you need to change your mind. It's so deep that maybe this will help you now. He's speaking of an exchange of mind. An exchange. He's telling you that the way you're thinking about him, about God, the way you think about sin, the way you think about his son and what he did and, and how he lived, the way you're thinking, you need to exchange your own mind. You need to turn away from your own thoughts. And instead of your mind, you need to accept God's mind. This is what it says in Isaiah 55. God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. So the way you think about things, the way you think about yourself, the way you think about God or, or Christ or any of these majorly important issues, 
God says you need to exchange your mind. You need to get rid of the way you're thinking about things and trade that. Turn away from that and trade that for the way God thinks about things. And the marvelous thing is this, my friend. We can do that because God has revealed his mind. You see, when we hold up the word of God, the word of God, the word of God is God revealing his mind. He has spoken his mind. That's how a word is the expression of what somebody thinks, the expression of their mind. And so we know God's mind. We don't have to be ignorant. We don't have to sit around and wonder. I wonder who God is. God has told us who he is so clearly. We don't have to wonder what does God think about sin or what does he think about what Christ did or or any of these issues. God has made it so clear. And so what you need to do tonight. What you must do. This is not a TED talk. This is not a, a presentation where you listen and you say, well, OK, that's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll just think a little bit more about that. No, what you must do, what Christ is commanding you to do, what God is commanding you to do through me is for you to trade your own thoughts, exchange them. Get rid of your own thoughts about what you think about God and trade them for his own thoughts. My, what a change. What an exchange. You talk about a good currency exchange. You talk about value for your dollar. Your thoughts? My thoughts? To be able to get rid of them and have the thoughts of God from his word and to have our minds saturated with what God says. That's what it means to repent. So deep that it is an exchange of mind. It is to think God's thoughts. We will look at it just briefly in these areas. You need to change your mind about what you think about God. So many people have wrong thoughts about God. In fact, the reason I have thought about this myself recently, as I've had the opportunity in the last year to talk to people of all kinds of religious backgrounds, people who are atheistic, people who are all kinds of religions. And it's so different, some of their viewpoints. But one thing I just found recently that is exactly the same in all of them. When you ask them about God or you ask them about, you know, where would you be if you died tonight? You know what they inevitably all start with? I think. I think God is a loving God. I think I'm a good person. I think that if I do the best I can, if there is a God, he would have to let me into heaven. I think that we all make mistakes and God may judge the murderers and God may judge awful crimes that we can think of. But little mistakes like lying, disobeying your parents. I think you see what's the same there. No matter who you talk to, I think I think you see, that's why you have to repent. That's why you have to change your mind. It's not about what you think. You see, I'm not going to heaven because I think I've done it the right way. I'm going to heaven because the Bible says, God says, Christ died for the ungodly. God says that he that has the son has life. I am depending on the thoughts of God as revealed in his word. And that's what you must do. You have to get rid of what you, what you think. And people, when it comes to God, my, how many different views there are about God. The common view in the United States anyway. The common view about God is he's like a grandfather. Or he's like Santa Claus, right? And he doesn't really care about too many of the mistakes we do. He doesn't really fuss about many of the problems we have. He understands, you know, and he, his, his whole ambition is for us to have such a great life down here. His drive is to give us our best life now. This is, this is the way so many people think about God. But you see, the Bible doesn't depict a God who's holly and jolly. The Bible doesn't depict a holy God. You could scrap an L. You'd be a lot closer. The Bible says he's a holy God. The Bible says he's a God who is totally different than his creation. The Bible says he is pure. The Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The Bible says that when one came into that heavenly court and defiled it, when Lucifer wanted to be like the most high, he was banished to hell. The Bible says that when one sin defiled the Garden of Eden, that first couple were told to get out, to leave. God is a holy, righteous God, a God who must punish sins. He must punish every single crime, whether it is a crime that we may think of as big, like murder 
or whether it is a lying tongue. The Bible says in, in the Old Testament that swearing, taking the name of the Lord in vain was a capital offense. That disobeying your parents was punished by stoning. This is God now. You say, I don't think about God like that. <laughs> the God I think about is far more comfy and loving. Well, you got the wrong thoughts of God, my friend. Right? You got to trade your thoughts for what this book says. You got to trade them. You got to get rid of what you think about God and accept what God says about himself. I mean, that's incredible pride for God himself to say, this is who I am. And for you to say, thanks, this is who I think you are. That's unbelievable. But people are doing that all over this world today. They just dismiss the Bible and they say, I'll keep my thoughts about God. No, my friend, God is holy. God is personal. He's not a distant deity. He didn't create the world. And now he says, well, I winded up the clock and I'll just let it go. And I'm off busy doing other things. And God is personally interested in this world. The Bible says he's so interested in Psalm 139 that he knows everything you've done today. He knows how many times you got up, how many times you sat down. <laughs> he knows exactly what you're thinking about right now as you're listening to this message. He knows everything about you. He's personal. Paul said that in him we live and move and have our being. This is God. He's personal. He's strong. He created the world out of nothing. But he's a holy God. He's a God that. Here's the last one I'll just mention to you about God. The whole Bible is about God. But he's a God that you and I will meet. There's so much difference likely between. Myself and so many other people here on this call. You know, every one of us is going to meet God. You're going to meet God. I'm going to meet him too. You say, I don't think I'm going to meet him. Well, the Bible says you're going to. And when you meet God, it's not going to do to say, well, I didn't think I would meet you, Lord. I didn't think. No, no. He'll say, I told you. I sent a weak little preacher right to your home and told you that you're going to meet me. Listen, my friend, you got to exchange your thoughts. And accept God's thoughts. Accept his thoughts about himself. God is a holy God. Is he loving? <laughs> yes, the Bible says we wouldn't even know love if it wasn't for God. Is he caring? Yes, infinitely caring. Do you know any blessing you have today? If you're not sick today. If you don't suffer from incredible pain today. You know, it's at the mercy of God. It's not a chance. God, so caring, so loving, but holy. You got to change your mind about God. He is a holy, righteous God, not Santa Claus, not a grandfather. The next thing you need to exchange your mind now. Now, what you're doing is you're not just getting rid of your mind and accepting what I say. You're changing your mind for what the Bible says. You're allowing your mind to be enlightened that's what the bible says it says the entrance of my word gives light and you're allowing your mind to be enlightened by the word of god and you're able to see clearly it's a great thing to walk in the light and you need to change your mind now exchange your mind from whatever you think to what god thinks not just about him but about sin god says about sin well let me just ask you what do you think about sin? Do you think sin's a big deal? Do you think sin is maybe just the small little mistakes we make and everyone does it? We all mess up. We all lie and cheat and we all have pride, steal, swear. Do you think sin is just something on the outside? You see, the Bible has the answer. This is what God says about sin. The Bible says that sin is a capital offense. The Bible says this, the soul that sins shall die. It is a capital offense to God. The Bible takes a sin like murder and a sin like lying and disobeying your parents, and it puts it in the same thing as those who will be cast into the lake of fire. The Bible says that sin is a capital offense. It is punishable by death. The wages of sin is death. This is what the Bible says that for your sins tonight, whether it's lying or cheating or whatever it is on your record that God knows and that, you know, 
for your sins. It is a death penalty. It is rebellion against the way God has intended you to live today. He has designed you. He has programmed you in a way that you should have lived. You have rebelled against his way of living. You have done it your own way. Just like Adam and Eve did it their own way and took the fruit. Just like so many people down human history, down to me and down to you. And the Bible says for those sins, it is death. It is a death penalty. That's what the Lord Jesus was speaking of here in Luke 13. When it comes to perishing, it is to endure the righteous judgment of God for our sins. The Bible says it's death. The Bible says that it's not just the things that we've done. It's not just something on the outside, like fruit on a tree. But the Bible says the reason the fruit's on the tree is because it's an inside problem. It's an inside problem. It says that we were born in sin. You say, I thought I was born a pretty good person. I was talking to a man just not too long ago, just a couple weeks ago. And he told me this. He said, you know, Joey, <laughs> he said, you must have had a pretty privileged upbringing, didn't you? He lived in a trailer park, this man. He said, you must have had a lot of money growing up. You must have had a great education. And all the toys and all the things, that's why you turned out so good. But you see me, I didn't have it so good as you. Yeah, and all this abuse happened in my childhood. I had a, an awful death in my family. And that's why I'm the way I am. It's because of my upbringing. I, was, I had to acknowledge to him, I did have it. I was privileged in my upbringing. I was very blessed. But I told him, I said, the problem is not your upbringing. I said, because I could point you to people who are living at the top of the world today, at least as far as human beings are, are concerned, wealthy, healthy. They have everything that you could possibly want. And they're sinners to the core. And they're alcoholics. And they're drug abusers. And they're proud. And they live their life. Now, here's the crowning sin. You say, I think the crowning sin is, you know, doing drugs. Here's the crowning sin. They're living their life happy without God. Independent of God. Such is the sin of the devil. Such was the sin of Adam and Eve. Independent of God. And that's how they're living. And I told him, I said, it's not an outward problem. You could win the lottery tomorrow. And you could move to the nicest mansion in Jackson. <laughs> if there are any around here. It wouldn't change anything, my friend. You see, it's an inward problem. That's why Jesus looked at the most religious, the most privileged man, probably, floating about Judea. And he told Nicodemus, you, my friend, must be born again. It's an inward problem, you see. So sin is not just these things that we've done that are a capital offense against a holy God. That's what the Bible says. That's his thoughts now. That sin is a capital offense, punishable by death. But that we are helpless to do anything about it because our our whole nature is filled with sin. Everything we do is stained with sin. Even when we do good things, there's a sinful motive often behind it. It's like it's like having a dirty window. And all you have to clean that dirty window is a dirty rag. And you're just trying to clean a dirty window with a dirty rag. And would it work? You say it could never work. You just smear the dirt. And that's all people are doing when they try to clean up their own life. No, my friend, the whole nature is corrupt. The whole nature is sick. We are sinners. Yes, and what we've done on the outside. Yes, those are crimes against God that will be punished by, by death. They must be punished. For God is good and holy. But it's a problem inside. We're sinners to the core. We're sinners in our heart. The Lord Jesus on another occasion when they were questioning him about washing his hands. He said, from the heart. Proceeds theft and adultery and fornication and uncleanness. It all comes from within. And so you see, you got to change your mind now. You got to stop, stop thinking that, you know, I have actually a really good heart deep within and deep down inside. If I could just tap into my deep down inside goodness, and if my situation was changed, if I had a new job, a new boss, a new wife, if everything was just good in my life, I would be just a really good person. No, my friend, you got to get rid of them. what the Bible says about sin. That it's who you are. That you are like a sheep by nature that goes astray. That all of us turn our own way. You got to exchange your mind. Repentance now. Accept ye repent. Change your mind about God. Change your mind about sin. The Bible's picture about you, about you, of you, and of me. 
is so desperate. It's so hard to look at. It's so uneasy. And yet, you see, that's why the Lord Jesus was pressing this upon these people who were getting distracted by the current events because the picture is a real picture. It's who we are. Not only are we guilty before God, not only is he a holy God who must judge our sins. If he doesn't judge the sins, he's not a good God and he is good. He's a good God. Not only are all these things true, but we are absolutely helpless. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't pay anything to God. We can't sacrifice anything to God. We are absolutely helpless without strength. I wonder, have you changed your mind about that? Anyone here tonight? And you think there's something you can do? Maybe you think if I got down on my knees and if I opened Romans 5 and 6 and I repeated it out loud and I put my name in the verse, maybe then, maybe then I would be saved. No, my friend, there's nothing you can do. I tried to do that. The night I wanted to be saved, I tried to put my name in Romans 5 and 6 and John 3, 16 and Romans 5 and 8. I put my name in all the verses and I was lost. You know, when I got saved, I didn't have to put my name in any of them. <laughs> I saw it as clear as day. You see, the light came in. I knew exactly who it was talking about. You must repent. You must exchange your mind when it comes to God and when it comes to sin. You must exchange your mind when it comes to Christ. You see, as we stand before God in our sins, God must, this is what his word says now. This is his thoughts. He must punish sin. Your sin. But Christ has come into this world. And the Bible says it like this. Christ Jesus came into the world. To be our savior. He came into the world to save us. The father sent the son to be the savior of the world. Unto you is born this day in the city of David. A savior, which is Christ the Lord. He shall save his people from his sins. My friend. He is the savior. He has come to save us, save us from the wrath of God. And the answer to how he saved us from God's wrath is found in the cross. It's found in what he did on the cross. You see, so many people, when they come to what they think about Jesus, what they think about Christ, they think that he came to be a great example. I was talking to a lady not too long ago, and she told me this. She said, Jesus is such a great example. If only we had more people like him around. With all the things going on in our world, if only we had more people like Christ and my I am going to try to be as much like Christ as I can. What an ambition. What an ambition. And I think he's just the greatest model for my life. And I'm going to just try to be just like him. But no, my friend, he didn't come primarily to be the model for anyone's life. He came to save people from who they are and what they've done. It's so clear. That's what God says. He didn't come to be a helper. He didn't come to do half the work and you do the next half to pay half the debt and you do the next half to pour in half the medicine. But you had your bit. No, my friend, the whole part of the Bible is he came to heal. He came to save. He came to forgive. He turned to a man one day and he said, your sins are forgiven. There's nothing that man needed to do. Rise up and walk. This is Christ. He came to save. And, you know, like I said, how did he do it? He went to a cross. On the cross, as they nailed him there, as he's hanging between heaven and earth, God is placing the judgment of our sin on him. That's God's thoughts. Now, this is what it says All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way. But the Lord placed on him the sin of us all. That God judged Christ on the cross as he's hanging there in shame, in agony, as he's suffering there. God placed all of our wrath, all of his wrath against our sin on Christ. God crushed him. That's what the Bible says. He was crushed for our transgressions. And that's what it was for now. It was for our transgressions. I remember the night I got saved. That's what came into my mind. I knew as I lay across the bed, I was lost. I was guilty. But this verse came into my mind, but he was wounded for our transgressions. That's what God says. That's what he came to do. He came to take our place. He came to pay our debt. He suffered in our place. This is what the Bible says now. This man, after he had offered one 
sacrifice for sin forever, sat down. He paid the debt. He, he, he took the wrath. He took the wrath of God on himself. He cried, it's finished. And when it comes to the issue of sin, now remember, God's thoughts about your sin is that he must punish them. The Bible says Christ took the punishment. Now, the big question is not so much what you think about that. You may think many things about that, but the big question is, what does God think about that? Does God think that the punishment Christ took was good enough? Well, on the third day, when God raised Jesus back from the dead, God was announcing to the world that it is good enough. He was sharing to the whole world that there is nothing else necessary to be done, and there's nothing else that can be done. And anybody who tries to do something else, they say, yes, I'll take Jesus, but I'll also do something else. What they're saying that the Lord Jesus did is not enough. And God is saying it is enough. It is enough that Jesus died. God is saying what he did when it comes to sin, I have accepted. I'm satisfied with his payment. There's no more sacrifice needed. It's all done in Christ. You want to know what God thinks, my friend? What God thinks about sin is that it's so awful that he crushed his only son. He crushed his only son. But what God thinks about you is he loves you so much that he crushed his only son. He crushed him for you, my friend. He crushed him for you. He's offering tonight Christ to you. He has crushed him on behalf of the sinner. So highly does God value us. And he is satisfied with him. I will close my portion now tonight of this meeting. Listen, my friend, this is what you need to do, except you repent. You need to exchange your mind, your thoughts about God for his thoughts. He's holy and just and good. You need to exchange your thoughts about sin for his thoughts. It's a capital offense and the soul that sins will die. You need to exchange your thoughts about Christ for his thoughts. He's the savior who has satisfied the claims of God. And he's available to anyone who will trust him. But lastly, I will close with this. You need to exchange your thoughts about today. What do you think about today? You said today's just another Sunday night in September. And they've been preaching the gospel through this medium for weeks now. And I'm sure I'll be getting a notification for next Sunday. It's interesting. They get different guys up there and they get all fired up, some of them. <laughs> you need to change your thoughts, my friend. You know what the Bible says? You know what God says about today? God says that today is your opportunity. There are people on this call who may not make it. This is not a scare tactic. This is not a salesman pitch. They may not make it to the end of the week. They may not make it to get another notification next week. Remember what he says. The Tower of Siloam just suddenly fell on people. There's no guarantees, my friend. There's no... No promise. The Bible says this. This is God's thoughts now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And I can tell you, as somebody who grew up hearing the gospel, I've heard it for all my life. The day I was saved was the day I exchanged my thoughts for God's thoughts on this issue. Now. It's now. It's not going to wait till next summer. It's not going to wait till the next tent series. It's not going to wait till the next gospel meeting. It's tonight. It's now. I needed it now. You see, when you need to be saved, you need it now. There's an urgency. Look at that man, Bartimaeus, on the side of the road. They said, be quiet, Bartimaeus. Don't bother the master. No, Bartimaeus says, it's now or never. And my friend, you need to come to that point. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today. Today. Not tomorrow. Not a while from now. It's today that you need to be saved, that you need to repent. How do you do it? You face what God says. What did Dave say at the beginning of this meeting? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to hear the word of God. Reject your own thoughts. Whatever you may think of these issues. God rests in his word. And you'll be saved. Repentance. Forgiveness of sins. When you come today. Before I pray. I'll just close with one verse. Today, if you have heard his voice, don't harden your heart.